Hello, sir. Good morning. My name is Dr. Sam, one of the PCs candidate here today. I've been asked to examine your legs. Is that all right? Yes, sir. So what I'm going to do, I'll have a very good look and then assess your muscle strength and also some of the reflexes in your legs. So during this procedure, if you have any of the pain and discomfort, just let me, I'll stop at that moment. Yes, my dear doctor, immediately after entering into the room, the five important steps that you need to do, I always speak on that. You always have a good smile with a good greeting smile, yeah. So yes, the greetings should be fast. But yes, my dear, listen very carefully. You enter into the room with the good smile, the good greetings, means the greetings. And in the meantime, you have to wash your hands and handshake with your patients. And this is the greetings will be the completed if you do with the good smiling, with the washing your hands and handshake with your patient. These three important components that you need to do. So yes, my dear doctor. So good greetings. Immediately after that, introductions, my dear. The next second important point, introduction. Introduce yourself. My name is Dr. Saha, one of the patients candidate here today. And third is an instructions. Yes, my dear, you need to do the instructions. Instructions means that what you're going to do, what is written and what is instructed to do for this case, my dear. So you need to see here what is written here. The station three neurology, this young boy is a toxic examining the lower labs. So yes, my dear doctor, you enter into the room, you have to see what is written, what is, what is instructed to do. So yes, you need to do the exam in the lower leg. So instructions is important. So you need to tell to your patients that, that sir, I have been asked to examine your legs. So this is very important and a bit, a brief description that you need to do that what you're going to do. I have, have a very good look and maybe assess with muscle strength or all maybe the nerves of your lower limbs. You can say in that way. Yes, during this procedure, if you feel any kinds of pain and discomfort, just let me know is I call it the pain management, my dear. So I call it the pain position and poser, this three important component father that you need to do. So yes, the total six complete packages that you need to do, starting with the greetings, introduction, instruction, then pain, position, and poser. Pain, yes, as I said, daily discomfort and pain management that you need to tell. And each and every station, like the station three, that the neurology that you need to tell for each and every case is my dear, the same, same, same steps that you need to follow. And next is the position, my dear, for the lower limb exa examination that you need to make the patient lying flat in bed. And last is a poser, my dear, the exposer. You need to expose the lower limbs, like the way the limbs, is, the lower limbs and legs are exposed to the mid thigh after the lower leg. And that should be fully exposed. So you need to do that. And you need to tell that, would you mind, sir, just put off your gown and put your band up for me that I need to examine you. So these are the ways that you need to examine and before handling your patients, these are the important six important steps that you need to know, my dear. So once again, that I'm re recapping once again, what is that starting with the introduction instructions? So yes, my dear, you need to do the six important steps starting with the greetings, introduction instructions, and next is the pain position and poser, that exposure that you need to do. So once again, my dear, listen very carefully the important tips and tricks. You enter in the room and you need to see the instructions. As I said earlier, and other, other important tips and tricks, and these important tips and tricks in neurology especially, the instructions is sometimes giving a good diagnosis. If you're lucky enough that you'll get a certain instructions, like the young boy is a toxic, so examine the lower limbs. So I did listen very carefully. Already you know what does this ataxia really means. I said the A for absent and toxia means the balance, my dear. So the absent balance, so now you need to know the balance is maintained by the three important components in our body. The first one is the cerebellum, second is the vestibulum, and third one is the peripheral nerves that comes from the dorsal column, means I call it the dorsal column sign, peripheral nerves that are responsible for the joint position senses, my dear. So the three important components is the cerebellum, vestibulum, and the peripheral nerves, the sensory nerves. So now, if you say the ataxia means the absent balances, so definitely the cerebellar lesion, and definitely the second one is the vestibular lesion, and third one is the peripheral neuropathy, the sensory neuropathy. We call it the cerebral ataxia, and then the vestibular ataxia, and third one sensory ataxia. So these are the three categories of the ataxias. So now, let me start once again. You have seen this boy is ataxic, so you can make your diagnosis 
It can be cerebral ataxia, it can be vestibular ataxia, it can be sensory ataxia. But my dear listeners, very carefully in your exams, so vestibular ataxia usually not come to your cases. Yes, it goes to the ENT department, so you, do, you don't need to worry about, yes, and also not a very frequent cases that you need to think about it. So you can think about maybe the cerebral ataxia and the sensory ataxia, or maybe combination of these both together. So yes, my dear doctor, listen very carefully. I'm giving you important tips and tricks. If the young boy with the ataxia, yes, you should think about the single diagnosis in your hands, the Fred Dix ataxia. What I say once again, young boy ataxia, the diagnosis is Fred Dix ataxia. So yes, once again, the Fred Dix ataxia involving both the cerebellum and the peripheral nerves and the sensory one, means the sensory ataxia, means the Fred Dix ataxia involving the both cerebellum and as well as the peripheral nerves, the sensory nerves involving and responsible for the dorsal column sign. So yes, you see that you enter into the room and you have seen a young boy is lying flat on the bed and also you have seen the instructions is written that the young boy is ataxia, so diagnosis is done the Fred Dix ataxia. Now you have to demonstrate the important features of the Fred Dix ataxia to the examiners, all them together so that you can say yes, the Fred Dix ataxia. So yes, you think about the Fred Dix ataxia, now you know about the Fred Dix ataxia, what does it really mean? You need to have some of the important components before handling the patient's mind, yeah. You need to show, demonstrate the important signs of Fred Dix ataxia consistent your diagnosis. Put it there. Before going to the Fred Dix ataxia, Fred Dix is, is an important component of the hereditary ataxias. So hereditary ataxias, the first one is the Fred Dix ataxia and second one is an ataxic telangiectasia. I used to call the F-A-A-T, means the fat, my dear. So once again, Fred Dix ataxia and ataxic telangiectasia. As I said, the young boy, yes, of course, with the ataxia, so think about the diagnosis, Fred Dix ataxia. So Fred Dix ataxia, under the heading, sometimes we, 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 we give a good big headings like the spinal cerebral ataxia. Yes, under the headings of the spinal cerebral ataxia, there are long list of ataxias, but one of the hereditary ataxias that you need to know that is the Fred Dix ataxia. So now I can say the Fred Dix ataxia is nothing but spinal cerebral ataxia. It does mean the spinal cord and the cerebellum both will be involved in this disease, my dear. So you need to demonstrate the cerebellar signs and the spinal cord damage that leads to the spastic preparations and also, as I said, the peripheral nerves in the dorsal column. So the dorsal column signs that are involved as well. The best and the best and the best course ever you will experience in your whole life, my friend. Well, along with that, yes, because of the peripheral nerves are also involved, so that we will get some of the lower motor neuron type of the weakness as well. So as I said, the spinal cord is involved. So the upper motor neuron type of the weakness means upper motor neuron type of the lesions. As I said, the peripheral nerves as well. So the, yes, the lower motor neuron type of the weakness, so the mixed pictures as well. And as well as the, yes, once again, the dorsal column signs, the sensory ataxias will be there. I mean, the sensory nerves will be also affected. So the both lower sensory and motor nerves will be affected, but along with the upper motor neuron type of the weakness. Yes, my dear, let's start and think about it. Yes, we have to demonstrate this man and this young boy having some of the upper motor neuron type of the lesions and also the lower motor neuron type of the lesions as well as, yes, my dear doctor, there's the dorsal column is affected. So now the upper motor neuron lesions, as I said, the bundle packs that HSCE means the hypertonia, hyperreflexia, clonus, and extensor plantar. So yes, my dear, among them, I said it, the extensive plantar is the pathognomonic features to diagnose the upper motor neuron type of the lesions. 
and next is the long to neuron type of the lesions. Yes, you will get the, all the features with the weakness, wasting, and fasciculation. I used to say the WWF. So we need to see the, yes, the wasting is one of the important features that will give an idea. Yes, the long motor neuron lesions. And also you can get the hypotonia and then can, you can get some of the hyporeflexia as well. But here's the most important feature is the wasting, yes. The next point is the peripheral nerves. That is the sensory, means the dorsal column is affected. So the dorsal column, if, if it is affected, then you'll get the joint position senses and the vibration senses are lost. So yes, my dear doctor, you need to show at least these features because these features will have the long list of differential diagnosis altogether we'll discuss later on. But let's start how to do examine and how to think and how to reach towards your diagnosis, my dear, in a case of young boy ataxic. Yes, my dear doctor, immediately after entering the room, yes, as I said that, you need to examine the boy and definitely the lower limbs that has to be exposed and you need to start your examination, the inspection. And the inspection starts from the foot and bed. So that you can see, once again, inspection, we are looking for wasting mitre, as well as the fasciculation and maximum the scar marks. So we need to see what the findings in his case. So let's see how to do that. You need to come, come up here from the foot in bed. And you see that I have a very good look and just look onto the distal part of the legs and also the distal part here and there and also the proximal part of the muscles that we are looking for wasting. So we have seen a significant wasting in the distal part he has and having some of the proximal part also some of the wasting. So we can say some of the generalized wasting but having some of the distal part is more predominant. So distal part wasting definitely the nerve disease no doubt about it. Now you can see some of the fasciculations that you are expecting. So there is no fasciculation. So only the wasting that we found the distal predominant, then there are the proximal part. And there is no obvious scar marks as well. So in inspection that you yes, young boy toxic and once again you inspect this young boy. But once again, my dear lower limbs examination should be started with the gait examinations. So yes, immediately after the six important steps that you come up here and you need to tell this young boy because this lower limbs examination should be started with the gait, my dear. So the gait examination that you need to tell to your patients that, sir, will you be able to walk for me? So this is very much important because the patient cannot walk. So how can you start the work? So you need to tell and ask his permission whether he can able to work for me. And once again, if the any of the bedside Maybe the wheelchair will be there so you can understand the patient is really unable to walk. So yes, you can ask him, will he be able to walk for me so that you can just stand up and make some of the walking and see the gait. So this boy is really unable to walk because of the ataxia, the balance problem, both sided. But we are demonstrating here how this young boy having such a both sided ataxia but you shouldn't do in the real exams because he's really a talk It's really difficult a single man supporting him and doing an attack shake and, and showing the gate examinations. All right, let's start. Yes, try to walk for me, sir. Yes. So you can see he has the difficulty of walking. And really difficult, so uh, in the real exams, you don't need to examine that gait in his case, but we are just showing him how the difficulty is going on. So the two doctors has to take the good supports to walking and he needs the walking aids to work. So now turn around, turn around. So yes, yes. So really difficult for him to walk, you see the legs. Really walking difficulty, but see the gate here. It's a bit of spastic gate that we can observe. Yes, now turn around. Turn around. Yes. Turn around. Yes. Once again, you see a bit of spastic 
And the most important, the toxic gate. Yes, the toxic. He's a toxic. So, yes. Now turn around once again. Yes. Yes. Yes, see. So he's really a toxic. So you have to give the two both sides is support on the both side. So, no, just stand now. Turn down, turn down once again. Turn down. Turn down. Yes. Yes. So can you close your feet together? Yes. Now see, it's really difficult to stand for him. To look forward, look forward. Right. So now see how he is a toxic really. Ready? One, two, three. So you see that he is a toxic. So he's really a toxic so that, yes, it's really difficult to do the test in real exams. So you shouldn't do that. So now get back. And once again, now close your eyes. Close your eyes. So once again, it's more a toxic also, you see. So yes, with the open eyes, a toxic is a cerebral syndrome. And with the closed eyes, more a toxic, yes. So this is also the rhombus test is positive. So yes, he has got the cerebral syndrome as well as the dorsal column is also affected. Yes, now open your eyes. Now, now yes, get the seat back, sir. Yes, fine, the doctor. As you have seen the gait examinations, and he has a typical ataxic gait, my dear. And along with the ataxia that we have seen, he has a little bit high step that we can see and observe and really a difficulty in walking altogether. So yes, immediately after the gait examination that you have seen that he has, the test that he have done, the toxic test, there is a cerebellar science with the open eyes, he has the problem and also with the closed eyes with the more toxic. So you can understand he has a toxic gait as well as he has the rhombus test also positive. So cerebral ataxia once again along with the sensory ataxia all together, the diagnosis, the single diagnosis, the Fredericks ataxia. Assuming that that you made your diagnosis Fredericks ataxia, then you just bring your patients back onto the couch and then start examination of the lower limbs, then inspect the lower limb start. All right, you see the side view, he has got a pace covers. So this is another side view on the left hand side. So this is also the pest cavus, you see. So you see the pest cavus. So it's a cavity, my dear. You see the cavity? So this is a pest cavus, the typical pest cavus. So typical pest cavus means the long standing peripheral neuropathy. So long standing peripheral neuropathy and the joint position sense because he want to cuff and cuffed onto the floor. So that's why this pest cavus the long standing feature is the long standing peripheral neuropathy. So you see here, you see on the left hand side also, you see the pest cavus. So this is the cavity, you see a big cavity is here. So this is also a pest cavus. So these pest cavus are bilaterally pest cavus. Young boy, once again, the feature of the long standing peripheral neuropathy. So now you have to start immediately after the inspect that you found that the some of the wasting more on the distal without fasciculations and without any scars. Yes, my dear doctor, then you need to do the motor examination. As I said, the motor examination starts from TPR, PRCC, my dear. So the tone power reflexes and the plantar response and the C for clonus and C for coordination. These are the tests that you need to do and demonstrate the examiners that you are expecting the findings to show to make you diagnose it that you already diagnosed within your mind that runs in your mind by the diagnosis of phatic seduction. Yeah. So yes, let's start with the tone examination. And tone examination starts with the patients and saying that, sir, we'll just keep your legs floppy and relax as much as you can. I'd like to test the tone of your legs or muscles of your legs, my dear. So what you need to do, yes, the floppy 
and you see the tone, you see the tone. So actually we are looking for, as I said, we are looking for hypotonia rather than hypotonia. So the findings a bit of hypotonia is there, but once again you don't need to take it as a hypotonia. Because as I said earlier that you need to take the hypertonia as a findings for the upper motor neuron type of the weakness that you are expecting. But here you see this movement. Yes, you can say hypo or maybe the normal tone is very difficult to interpret. Right? And once again the sudden movements, you see, so this is also not at least the hypertonia, it may be hypo or maybe normal tones. So this is the examination. and the best and the best course ever you will experience in your whole life. Man. Yes. So immediately after that you found that the tones are not increased, at least not increased that you are expecting. So you shouldn't do the clueless test my dear. Because the hypertonia, if you found, then you should do the clonus. Otherwise, you shouldn't do that. So you found the tone is reduced or maybe the normal. And immediately after the tone, that the power test that should be done, and you need to tell to your patients, sir, I'd like to assess the strength of your muscles. So what do you need to do? Just tell him, just raise the right leg over the bed for me without bending your right knee. Yes. So you need to tell him. So you see, he's really difficult. To hold it, hold the hold the right leg. Yes, raise the yes, the raising is very difficult. But he he can at least at this point. On, now on the left left side, he can, but he's unable to hold it. Yes, so he can understand. Yes, his legs are really weak, and the muscle strength is reduced. And you need to tell him yes. Now push onto my hands into the bed. So yes, it's really difficult. You see, I can I can hold it up. Now bend your knees, pull towards you. So yes, pull towards you. Don't let me straighten it. So he cannot. So you see, once again, once again. So yes. Now push onto my hands. Push. So yes, this is also weak. Push onto my hands. Push, push, push. So this is also weight. Now cock up your ankles back for me. Back, 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 back. Mm -hmm. Yes, don't let me push them down. Now push onto my hands, push, push, push. Yes. Now keep the great toe towards the ceiling. Towards the ceiling. Towards the ceiling. Don't let me push it down. Don't let me push it down. Don't let me push it down. Now push, 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 push. Now push. Yes. So what do we have found? Right, we found that he has the muscle strength is reduced both proximal and distal symmetrically. So immediately after the tone that you have done the power, the muscle strength, and now the TPR, the R for reflexes, my dear. So you need to take the hammer and do the test for the reflexes. So yes. You need to tell him, I, I'd like to see the reflexes of the legs. So you see the no contraction here. So the reflexes are reduced. Now if you found the reflexes, you are not getting that. So you need to do the reinforcement test, my dear. So you need to tell him, can you clench your teeth? Clench your teeth? Yes. And now clench. And see the reflexes are not there, only just a vibration is there, but no reflexes, no muscle contractions. So definitely the knee reflexes are absent bilaterally. Now the ankle jacks once again. So this is also absent. Now clinch your teeth. Clinch, uh, clinch. 
yes, this is also absent. Once again, clean your teeth, so only a vibration is there. So we found the both the knee reflexes and the ankle reflexes are absent bilaterally. Immediately after the, the tone power reflex that you have, saw, you, have, you have examined, so you need to do the plantar responses, the TPR, PR for the plantar responses. So let's see how the plantar response is. So you need to take it, this stick might, and you need to tell him, I need to scratch on the sole of your feet. It might be a discomfort a little bit, but you need to do that. So you need to scratch it, you see, immediately after that, you, you're looking for, you see, the toes are extended, so this is the extensor plantar. Yes, typically extensor plantar. So once again here, is also extensor plantar. So yes, the plantar responses are bilaterally extensor plantar. So what do you found? We found the knee and ankle reflexes are absent, but the extensor plantar. So once again, you can think about, yes, absent ankle jacks and extensor plantar is another important syndrome. So they can think about, yes, the Frederick's ataxia is among them that can produce. Yes, my dear. So immediately after the test that you found, the tone normal or reduced, power is reduced, means the strength muscle weakness is there, both the proximal and distal, and the reflexes, means the knee and ankle reflexes are absent, but bilaterally absence of plantar. Immediately after that, you need to do the C for coordination test, my dear, means the heel shin test that you need to do. So now see the, how the heel shin test. You can do it because the patient can raise the legs of the bed by himself. So you can do this test and this test is appropriate. If it would be something like the patient is unable to raise the leg of the bed, so in that case, you shouldn't do the coordination test, my dear. That will be inappropriate in that case. But in his case, you should and you must do the coordination test as because you already learned from the gate, the diagnosis, the ataxia, and you found that the cerebral ataxia is also there. So you need this Hilshin test is really in your hands getting the findings all together. So you need to tell him, sir, can you just put your legs here down to the knee and go through the shin and do it as quickly as you can. Try, try for it. Try for it. So it's really difficult for him, really, you see, once again. It's really difficult, he's unable to do so. So impaired heel shin test on the right side. Now on the left side. So it's really difficult for him, you see, difficult, really difficult. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. So you found the heel shin tests are also impaired, but sometimes the heel shin test, because of the weakness to that extent, the patient is really unable to do so. So a bit of confusions are there. But keeping in your mind is because you already have seen the ataxia, as a gait ataxia, and also you have found the cerebral ataxia as well as the sensory ataxia altogether. So we need to just now the sensory test to diagnose the sensory ataxia. And also you have to think about in your mind that at the end that you can see and you can tell to your examiner that I need to see the full cerebral examinations so that you can get the diagnosis in your hands. So yes, my dear doctor, the heel shin test is really important in this case, especially. Immediately after that, the motor examination, the TPR, PRCC that you already have done, the sensory test that you need to do. You already focused in your mind the dorsal column is affected in his case, that's a young boy. So you start with the dorsal column test and dorsal column signs involve the joint position sense and the vibration sensors. So let me start by the joint position sense and vibration sensors. Immediately after that, yes, once again, the dorsal column sign and the spinothermic tract signs all together sometimes can be also involved in his case. So you need to do the test for the dorsal column signs for the joint position sense and vibration senses and spinothermic tract sign for the cotinol and the pinprick test. So let me start showing that the joint position sense. So now look at look at the leg. You can you can raise the leg to show him this is up, this is down. Okay. Now close your eyes. Now tell me whether this is up or down. This is up. So he cannot say now this is up or down. So he's unable to do so. The joint position says is impaired. Now here. So he's saying down, but this is up. So yes, once again. 
down. Now I'm seeing his arm is confusing. The joint position sense very typical for the joint position sense is really impaired in his case. So yes, the dorsal column is affected. As we already have seen, the rhombus test is positive, significantly positive. So definitely the joint position sense and the dorsal column is affected. Now the vibration sensor that we need to test. You need to take this tuning fork and the vibrate here and just tell him, are you feeling the vibration, not the cold? And you need to say, this is the vibration test. Now close your eyes. Are you feeling the vibration? Yes or no? Yes. All right, he's saying the yes. Now tell me when it stop. Yes. Are you feeling the vibration? Yes. Now tell me how it stop. Now tell me are you feeling? Now tell me how it stop. Yes. All right, excellent. So this is very evident and very very obvious that his vibration sense is intact, but the joint position sense is absolutely lost. Immediately after that, that the DCS that he have done the joint position sense and the vibration senses. Then the test that we need to do, that is the spinothalamic tract science, the STS, my dear. And STS includes the cotonul and the pinprick. And cotonul test starts with this one, and you need to tell him, are you feeling? This is soft. Now close your eyes. I'll put in different places of your legs. If you found, then you say yes. If you don't, say no, okay? Excellent. So once again, the dermatome is really helpful. As I said earlier, my dear, can you just remember? Earlier, what you have done, you have done this is you need to remember this is L1, this is L2, and this is L3 knee. So we need to remember. As I said, the L1, L2, L3 the knee, and L4 is total medially down to the floor. And this is the dorsal with the L5, and the lateral border is the next one. So once again, L1, L2, L3 is the knee, L3 knee, and L4 medially down to the floor. L4 is down to the floor and dorsum is L5 and S1 is a lateral border. So you need to focus onto the dermatom. So are you feeling? No. This is? This is? This one? So I need to just tell him whether he is feeling or not. No. So this is L2, this is L2, L3, L3, L4, down to the floor. This is also L4. And the dorsum is an L5, an L5. And this is the lateral border, is an S1, and this is an S1. So this boy is saying that he is not getting the, yes, the soft coronal test is really absent in all the uh, lower parts of both legs. So you need to just coming up from down to up. So you need to tell that, are you feeling? So if you feel, if you feel, then let me know. He's, he's saying that he is not feeling. Now feeling, all right. He's saying that this is area he, he can feel. So now, now, best course ever you will experience in your whole life man. Now feeling so this is the area. So yes he has some of the lost of coronal sensation means the Sensory means the spinal tract sign is also lost in the both lower limbs bilaterally, a bit asymmetry. But yes, you can say uh, somewhat symmetrical loss of spinal tract signs altogether. The coronal test immediately after the coronal test, that you need to do the pinprick test, my dear. How to do that? Just tell him. Are you feeling now? 
this is sharp. Now close your eyes. Now I'll put in the same places. So if you feel, then let me know. Yes, if you don't, say no. Even if you feel any of the differences, just let me know, okay? So once again, this is, so he is swelling. So this is L2, yes. this is L3 knee, this is L4 yes. down to the floor, this is also L4, and this is the dorsum, L5, and this S1, this is L5, and this is the S1. And he is saying that he is getting the, all the sensation of the pinprick test. As somewhat, to some extent, the coronal are absent in the both lower limbs, but the, he has a pinprick test is really present. So yes, immediately after that, that you finish the sensory test, my dear, you formulate your diagnosis and in the meantime that you need to do, just give the clothes back and give a good smile and give a good thanks and say, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. And you have done excellent for me. You are super. Some of the sentences is really helpful to make the environment is really super or whatever fantastic you can say, my dear. And immediately after that, give the clothes back all together and yes, cover up of the bo both legs and then wash your hands and turn around to examine us and say them your completeness of your examinations. And you need to tell the examiner, sir, I'd like to complete my neurological examinations of this young boy to do the upper limbs examination, cranial nerves, higher psychic functions, and the cerebral syndrome altogether. And I'd like to finish my examinations at the bedside to see the observation chart that includes that the pulse, temperature, respiratory rate, blood pressure, and oxygen saturation. And once again, I'd like to see the urine dipstick to see the sugar, protein, RBC nitrides. And yes, my dear doctor, you need to tell all them together to finish the examination part that you have done adequately, properly, and effectively, completeness of your examination part so that you can get the satisfactory marks all together. Yes, my dear, the examination starts with the inspection that you have done, the motor examination, that the TPR, PRCC, and the sensory examination, the DCS and STS, and immediately after that, you've done all the steps before and after, and you finished it and wash your hands, then come forward and saying these three important components means the neurological examinations and then examination to see the observation chart and once again to do the urine dipstick that you finished your examinations effectively and completely, my dear. So immediately after that, you finished your examinations, saying them all them together, you need to present your case, my dear. And presentation is one of the most important integral part to satisfy the examiner and to impress the examiner to get the satisfactory marks all together. So I did listen very carefully on the important tips and tricks. If you're really confident, as I said, the instructions give the diagnosis of the phrenic ataxia. So you can start the examinations and you can start the presentations with the main diagnosis. Or you should think about the three important components that I already said in other instructions videos that you have already said and you have already learned them all together, the three important questions and answers that you need to make out in the presentation skills. And in presentation, then you need to start with the what type of the lesion might be the first. And second one is the why is the lesion. And third is the why is the lesion. So this is the best way actually to present your case. Or you can start your first diagnosis and then you can give the, all the evidences all together. But this is very high likely to get the impressions, the satisfactory marks all together from the examiners to say the three important questions and answers all together. So how to do that? Let's start with the first question and answer. And another important, always, always, I always say that, the important tips and tricks, always look at the both, both of the examiners, both of the eyes of the both examiners all together and put a smile and present your case with confidently. So my clinical diagnosis of this young boy, the type of the weakness that I found, there is a lower motor neuron type of the weakness. Yes, evidenced by there is a weakness and wastage. And also, but without any fasciculation, but without any scar marks. And I found the tone is normal to reduced, you can say, in that way. So, sir, my clinical diagnosis of this young boy, the type of the weakness that I found on examination of the lower limbs, there is the upper motor neuron type of the lesions, as evidenced by the bilaterally extensor plantar. And very typical findings of bilateral extensor plantar that I found. Along with that, there is a weakness and there is a wasting more on the distal than that of the proximal. 
but without any fasciculation and without any scar marks that I found. And regarding the tone that I found that the normal to reduced, but not the hypertonia, but not the hyperreflexia and not the clonasis really absent altogether. But once again, the putting all them together, what I found that the, both the upper motor neuron type of the weakness, along with the lower motor neuron type of the weakness, along with that bilateral pace cavus is really important findings. So sir, summarizing that, I have found that the, both the upper motor neuron type of the lesion, if it is by the bilateral extensor plantar, along with the lower motor neuron type of the weakness, that the wasting and weakness, both predominantly on the distal than that of the proximal, without any fasciculation, without any scar marks, and along with that, bilateral pescavas. And uh, I found the most important findings on the gate was ataxic gate, and the instruction is given the young boy's ataxic. So here's the upper motor neuron lesions and the lower motor neuron lesions, along with the, as I found the bilateral pescavas, and both the cerebral ataxia as well as the Rhombostasis is positive, means the sensory ataxia. And along with that, the sensory findings altogether that I found, there is the joint position sense is absent. But yes, vibration sense is intact. But cardinal test to some extent is lost, but the pin peak is intact. So the summarizing all them together, the lesion and the underlying etiology is the Frederick's ataxia. So, in that way, you can present or you can start your first presentation also be confident if you are really confident in your diagnosis. Or you can say some of the differential diagnosis in other ways. Yes, sir. So my critical diagnosis of this young boy is a Frederick's ataxia. Evidence by this young boy is ataxia according to the history and I found also the gate was ataxic bilaterally both, both sides and including the cerebral ataxia and the sensory ataxia. Along with that, I found he has got both the upper motor neuron type of the weakness and on the lower motor neuron type of the weakness, along with that bilateral pescavas. And also I have seen that, that this boy also has lost the joint position senses and which is one of the important components of the dorsal column sign. So putting all them together, this young boy is made the diagnosis in the Frederick's ataxia. I would like to see the more examinations especially the cerebellar syndrome altogether, and also to see that all the cerebellar functions are really impaired or not. Along with that, I'd like to know some of the skeletal deformities altogether, especially the pace cavus, as, as you already have seen, and then the scyphoscoliosis is another important component, mainly the scoliosis, and also the high aspellate, we'll see in his case whether it's really found or not. But in your examination, that you need to tell them these are the important skeletal features that you are looking for. But along with that, I would like to see and examine him at the best side whether he has got some of the extra neurological features or not. I used to call the extra neurological features are DOHS that you need to remember the mnemonic spider, the D for diabetes mellitus, O for optic atrophy, and H for high arched palate. Yes, spider, and once again H for Hokam means the hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy, and once again, the uh, S for sensory neural hearing loss, or you can say the S for S cavus. So these are the important components that you need to look for further so that you can make your extra neurological features and complications are really this boy having or not. So here's my idea. The D for diabetes at the best side, you need to see the pinpricks, the bedside, the hand, the middle, middle, middle finger that the fingertip spin pricks that you're looking for at the best side. And you can say that I need, I, I like to do the ophthalmoscope too for the, to see the retinopathy is a diabetic retinopathy. So at the best side, diagnostic points for the diabetes that you need to look for. And next for the overall optic atrophy. So once again, you need the ophthalmoscope to examine him, whether he has got the optic atrophy or not. And H for hokamide, the hypostro, hyper
and the best and the best course ever you will experience in your whole life, man. Topic obstructive cardiomyopathy. So you need to tell the exam. I'd like to cardiovascular examinations to look for the double apical impulse and the heaving apex beat. These are the important points at the best side for the hookum. And sometimes the patient underwent for the sound this important. Yes, the ICD pacing pacemaker. So you can see the pacemaker scar mark and the box all together at the best side make your diagnosis hookum. And next in the yes, as I said, the H for high R spellate. So you need to see him higher spallate this presence or not. And once again, the kyphoscoliosis, as for scoliosis, and as for sensory neural hearing loss, you need to do the release and wave test to make the diagnosis sensory, sensory neural hearing loss altogether. So these are the extra neurological features that you need to tell to the examiners, I'd like to do that. Immediately after that, the examiners always ask you the questions, my dear. These are very important questions with the Fredax, Fredix ataxia is an hereditary ataxia. So hereditary ataxia, once again, is an hereditary disorders. So definitely the genetics is involved. So examiners will ask you what genetics that you know and do know about, about the Fredix ataxia. So you need to tell him the answers in that way. So Fredix ataxia is an autosomal recessive disorder. And this is also, we call it that the trinuclear repeat expansion disorder. I call it the threats. So this trinuclear repeat expansion disorder and he has got the Genetic mutation, the, we call it the fetoxin gene on chromosome number 9 that you need to remember all together. So you need to tell, yes, this Fredix adduction is an autosomal recessive disorder, the fetoxin gene mutations on chromosome number 9, and these are trinucleotide repeat expansion disorder, and one thing in the GAA is a trinucleotide repetitions altogether that made this disease the trinucleotide repeat expansion disorder. But one of the important problems with this Fredix adduction is only the exception disorders to the genetic anticipation, means it doesn't follow the genetic anticipations, means other trinucleotide repeat expansion disorders follow the genetic anticipations, but only these diseases like the Fredix adduction don't follow the genetic anticipations. So you need to know, and next question will be asked, that what are the trinucleotide repeat expansion disorders? I need to say, yes, we call it the F2D, it's the name on x minor, then you need to remember. F2D is with the F2 disease, yes, F for Fredrick's adduction, F for Fragile X syndrome, and D for, once again, the dystrophia myotonica, and H for Huntington's disease. So these are the four important disorders that you need to remember, the threats, my dear. So these are the important questions that are usually asked. And sometimes uh, they are asking one of the important questions that the form is frosty, one of, one of the important points. This form is frosty is nothing but the family member sometimes getting some of the single, single component, the tiny components of the total Fredix adduction disease and their complications altogether. You tell them the form is frosty is something like that the family members can be suffered from some like the pace cavus and maximum sometimes the deep tender reflexes may be absent. So this is called the form is frosty, uh, means that the, some of the family members will have some of the complications of this Fredix adduction, but not that full down disorders altogether. So this is called the form is frosty. Next question, yes, the Fredix adduction is a clinical diagnosis. The examiner will ask you what investigations say that you will do. Yes, my dear doctor, this is very much important that what investigations that you need to do to formulate and to make your diagnosis the Fredix adduction. As I said, the Fredix adduction is a clinical diagnosis and maximum you can do the genetic test to confirm the diagnosis but the clinical diagnosis is enough to make the Fredrix adduction, but to exclude the other differential diagnosis of the Fredrix adduction. As because we have found this, the component of the syndrome, as I said, the spastic paraparesis means the upper motor neuron type of the lesions, along with the dorsal column sign, a group of disorders can present with these all them together. So you need to know that. We call it the CM fast. C for cervical myelopathy, M for multiple sclerosis. And FAST means the FA for Fredrix adduction, S for SACD means the subacute combined degeneration of spinal cord or SCDC sometimes we call it, and last for the T for tapoparesis. So yes, my dear doctor, you need to remember all them together CM FAST because you need to exclude clinically at the bedside also before saying that you diagnose the Fredrix adduction. Now let's talk about the cervical myelopathy. Cervical myelopathy or myeloradiculopathy needs the upper limb 
examination and that needs the important syndromes to be excluded. And most of the important points, even in the lower limbs, the asymmetry is a single point they need to remember. Means the findings of the lower limbs, if you get some of the asymmetrical findings of the leg weakness at least, means the right leg you get the 3 by 5 and the left leg you get the 1 by 5. So asymmetrical findings of the first diagnosis of cervical myelopathy so that you can exclude the diagnosis of cervical myelopathy even though you examine the lower limbs. And for multiple sclerosis, as I say, the multiple sclerosis means the young female love, means the young female or the female patients with this syndrome always think about multiple sclerosis. And next is the phreatic seductor, these young boys ataxic. The boys ataxic is, think about the diagnosis, phreatic seductor. Maybe the young girl, but yes, the boy is more predominant. Once again, the next important point, the young boy is really important, my dear. The young boy, I used to say, that is a less than 20 years. I mean, the 10 group of people are usually affected. This boy suffered from, for the last six years, and he started to notice himself that he has some of the difficulty in balance since he was aged like the 13 years and he's a 19 years old boy the six years back he noticed first that yes he has some of the progressive some problem with the uh, balance and the difficulty in walking so yes these are the important point the young boy means the less than 20 years with the teenage boys present with the taxia the first diagnosis phreatic seductia and this phreatic seductia not only the taxia single component the both component all together means the cerebellum and the peripheral nerves, the sensory component all together make him to be toxic. And cervical combined degeneration of the spinal cord means the SACD. Once again, the, this can also produce this category of the syndrome, but once again, it has the other important features because the B12, my dear, listen very carefully. The vitamin B12 deficiency is the most important cause that you need to remember the pernicious anemia. And the pernicious anemia also has got some of the other autoimmune associations. We'll discuss in another lecture, my dear. And next, the T4 tapoparesis is really important that you need to remember. What is this? There is a tapoparesis. This is very much important that Argyll Robertson people. So means that in his case also, you need to remember that you need to examine at least the pupillary reflexes are intact. So you can say this ARP is excluded. So you diagnose not the tapoparesis, not the neurosyphilis that I'm talking about. Yes, my dear doctor, putting and keeping all the important features, single single features, you can make out the diagnosis, the CM fast, but you include your diagnosis, the Frederick Sedaxia. Yes, my dear doctor, listen very carefully. As because I said the Frederick Sedaxia is a clinical diagnosis, and you can confirm it by doing the genetic test. So you need to exclude the other differential diagnosis, the most importantly, the spinal cord pathology that you need to exclude. And doing an MRI scan of the spinal cord and sometimes doing an MRI scan of the brain is really needed to exclude the other diagnosis. But the most important diagnostic test to exclude the other possible differential diagnosis is the spinal cord MRI. So yes, my dear doctor, we have done the spinal cord MRI in this case and so that we can understand this is a real case of Frederick's ataxia is diagnosed clinically. So now I'd like to show the spine MRI and you see the spine MRI and all the you see, the film is here, and there are a lot of films, so I don't want to show the, all the films all together. I'd like to show, the films showed that nothing at all, no abnormality found in the spinal cord pathology. The, the same intensity is found. So that's why I'd like to show and look at here, the findings of this patient, right? So you see the findings are suggestive of the grade 1 spondylolisthesis of L5 over S1 vertebra. So once again, grade 1 spondylolisthesis of L5 over S1 vertebra and scoliosis having rightward convexity. So there is a kyphoscoliosis, only the findings, but you see very close findings, you see the spine. It's really the spinal cord shows the normal in outline and homogeneous signal intensity. So once again, spinal cord shows normally in outside outline and homogeneous signal intensity. So spinal cord is normal in findings. So showing that the spinal cord normal, so we can exclude the other findings of the CM fast altogether. Means the C for cervical myelopathy, M for multiple sclerosis, and once again, Frederick Sedax is the clinical diagnosis here, and the cervical combined degenerative spinal cord, and lastly the tapoparesis. 
So the spinal cord MRI is really important to exclude the other differential diagnosis. So here only the findings is a scyphoscoriasis and no other findings. The spinal cord is normal. So that is the findings I'd like to emphasize so that we can make your diagnosis predict seduction.